All right, so I'm gonna start right here. I love using the book because this is where you're gonna get your answers from, so why not use it together? As always, I always copy and paste right here from the syllabus, the page numbers, so I know when we get to 1166, I can quit talking about it. That's what you should do too when you're reading. Um, if anything outside of that confuses you, then go back and reread for 242 or 170, whatever class you have previously. All right, so with this concept, if we're thinking about the liver, we're talking about cellular regulation, we're talking about infection, because these are the two major concepts that kind of come up. So when we think about what is your priority, think about what your priority as a nurse is for cellular regulation. What is your priority for a nurse with infection? Because there's only so much you can do, right? I say it again, as a nurse, I don't need a physician to do my job. The patient needs a physician to prescribe certain things so they can live, but that, that's not my job. I will use certain tools that the physician prescribes to that patient to help take care of that patient. But I always say the same thing. I don't call the doctor to tell me how to do my job, but I do collaborate with physicians to take care of patients that we share mutually. So what is your role in all of these? And then further, as we pop down a little bit more, the liver is part of the fluid and electrolytes. We're talking about inflammation, pain, nutrition. These are all those nursing concepts. So I put over here in my book, think nursing diagnosis. What can the nurse do to support these issues? What are we talking about? Cellular regulation, nutrition. If they tell you what's important, I assure you there's going to be test questions about cellular regulation, nutrition, and fluid and electrolyte balances. I know this because that's what NCLEX cares about, because that's what the State Board of Nursing cares about. So we have to care about it. All right, moving through, the first thing your book talks about, and the only thing in this chapter it says is cirrhosis. It says from 1155 to 1166, we're supposed to talk about cirrhosis. So I start out, what is cirrhosis? If you don't know what cirrhosis is, it's kind of tough. Somebody tell me real quick what cirrhosis means to you. I always think quick reader digest version. Anybody got a clue yet? You don't have to. I'm not trying to make you feel bad. Okay. What part of the body? No, the liver. Y'all know this already. I'm just giving you a hard time. So it is the liver, but what does that mean? Nothing. First and foremost, you have to know what the liver does. If you know what the role of the liver is, it's so much easier to understand when the liver is messed up, what the signs and symptoms will be. So if you don't know what the liver does, the liver does what? It filters. It filters the blood. It takes out impurities. It, it, it helps make certain things. It helps break down certain things. So that's what we have to recall. And as we go through this, I'll talk about it, but you really have to go back and understand what the liver does. Cause if you don't, it makes it hard. So what is cirrhosis? It's just damage. So I put, I make my own notes. You know, I always talk about this. I like notes for me because these notes make sense to me. You should make your own notes in your book. But all I'm saying is when you have a healthy liver, it is a nice filter, just like an air filter in your car or in your house or a water filter. What happens when the filter in your, your in your um, refrigerator starts to get clogged? There's no longer what? Flow. It's no different. So cirrhosis is just that. It's, it, it's scarring. It's, it's fibrotic changes to the healthy tissue. That just means you can't receive blood. If you can't receive blood, there are two problems with that. If I can't receive blood, where does the blood have to go? Y'all know the body. What happens if you can't get blood somewhere? Where does it go? You said down. What else? Back. It backflows. Y'all, it's just hyper, that, that, that's what cirrhosis causes. It causes It causes like hypertension of the liver. I know that makes no sense to anybody else, but I think in just broad spectrum type of things, there's a pressure issue, it backs up. So I have that, that problem. Plus I have the problem that the, that the liver can't do its job, which is to do what? Filter impurities out of blood to help break down dead red blood cells so we can poop those out. There's so many things it does, clotting factors. So if you know what the liver does, it's not surprising that every single test question you get right because you're like, oh yeah, if it doesn't do this, that's what I'm gonna focus on with you. Um, your book says it, it forms these nodular um, changes. I just heard of nodes and nodulars. That doesn't always mean scar tissue to me, but in my mind now it does. So I had to go back and rethink what that meant to me. So. Um, I, I keep talking here as well. Impairments in blood and lymph flow result in compression of, uh, I, I, I'm sorry, re result from compression caused by excessive fibrous changes. So what does that mean? It means not only do I have a problem with backflow or blood's backing up into the rest of my systemic problems. So that's causing more backflow and other things that back up, splenomegaly, ascites, uh, um, you start naming it, uh, uh, esophageal varices, y'all, they all start coming from this simple concept. So don't ever, don't ever overthink what the body does. Know what the liver does, the liver filters. When it doesn't filter, what happens? That's what you need to know. So 
there's also going to be lymphatic problems. So now we start thinking about infections and cancers, and you can start going right back up here. And what's it say? Fluid and electrolytes, inflammation, pain, nutrition, it all starts to make sense, right? So that's where I just want you to get your mind wrapped around this, because once again, I know your teachers are great. I know they're killing it in class. I'm just trying to tie some stuff together. So if this doesn't make sense, or if it does make sense, you're like, Mr. Stray, move on and just let me know, okay? And feel free to un unmute and just talk. This is for you guys, not me. All right, so complications of cirrhosis. If we have complications, you should probably know the complications because guess what disease you're never going to treat as a nurse? Cirrhosis, not your job, physician's job. Portal hypertension, we don't treat that either. Ascites and esophageal varices, bilirubin room obstructions, hepatic encephalopathy. You're right, we don't treat those specifically, but we have things we can do. First and foremost is to recognize why somebody might be at risk for this understand the patient laying in your bed, what kind of signs and symptoms they're gonna present with that are problematic. And what I can do as a nurse to ensure that we correct the problem or make it less worse. That's really it, right? So break it down like that. So let's just kind of go back and start right into it. We know what about the kidney? I don't know. Tell me about Buffalo. The heart beats, the left ventricle pumps blood out of the heart. Where does it go from there? To the body. It goes to the spleen as well. I, I, this is not 100%, y'all, but this is just the way Mr. Streb thinks about stuff. I think about when the blood leaves the heart, it goes through some stuff. It hits the spleen eventually. The spleen also does what? The spleen helps to filter things out. I think about arterial blood. That's just the way I think about it. And then from there, it goes throughout the body. It goes to the intestines. It does a lot of absorption of stuff. You know, the intestines absorb all kinds of uh fat soluble vitamins and then there's there's uh, water reabsorption and there's all kinds of stuff that goes on from there it goes to the the liver and the liver filters out all the crap literally you know, I don't want to say crap like that but all the stuff from the stomach and, and, and the the digestive process then the liver filters that out and it returns that clean blood right back up to your superior inferior vena cava, right right back into your heart again so it just starts making sense that all of the things that could go wrong go wrong when the liver is congested and nothing can happen. So you know, if, if, you don't, if that doesn't make sense, definitely go back in your book and look at some pictures. Google some pictures. Google some videos of how blood flows. Portal hypertension is just that. We're talking about pressure in that portal vein. So the portal vein does what? That is where blood flow comes back into the kidney, right? Not oxygenated blood. There's an artery that brings oxygenated blood to the kidneys to supply the kidney with oxygenated blood and nutrients so it doesn't die. That's not the hypertension we're talking about. We're talking about portal hypertension. We're talking about venous blood. So all that venous blood, where does it come from? I already told you where it came from. It comes from like the stomach and stuff like that. Look at my notes over here. I take notes just like you should. Receives blood from the portal vein, but it backs up. Into... These are just little things that I say out loud for me because they just make sense. They don't have to make sense to me, you. It had to make sense to me. So start thinking about what portal hypertension is. I go, sorry, let me get this back up real quick. So your book says it receives blood from the portal hyper vein, but it backs up. That what, that's what causes some of the varices. That's why people have the bleeding in their mouth. That's why they have the coffee ground emesis because the pressure starts to build back up and it starts to burst. That's not the only reason. I'm gonna talk about some of the intrinsic factors and the vitamin K and all the other stuff that also impacts uh, your body and why you bleed more. But this is what I want you to understand. These concepts here. I know your teacher talks about a lot. Look at this stomach. It comes back from, I, I say mouth to butt. This just, like I said, you could have varices anywhere. The stomach, uh, the spleen, that's what splenomegaly is. That's why when you start looking at people who have liver failure, they often have a spleen that you can palpate and you can fill the margins of. Look what else though. It leads to infection because it starts to build up. And we know what the spleen does. And the spleen also filters what? Impurities. And if it's not, if it's not doing that, it just allows for more infection. So that's why all this, I need you to understand the concepts you'll never have to memorize. Now you don't have to worry about ascites and varices. You know exactly why they happen, don't you? It's because of that pressure. It's because of that portal vein. It's because the fluid can't work its way back in there and it has to back up somewhere. So that's what ascites are. And that's what um, varices look like. They're just different locations. So ascites, varices, what's ascites? So if you start thinking about ascites, it's just fluid in the peritoneal cavity because that fluid drains into the portal vein. It goes into the liver. The liver filters that. It gives all the impurities out. And then the blood flow goes right back into the heart. Unfortunately, with liver failure, this is what happens. Have you ever wondered about, I mean, does that make sense? Have, did y'all have any questions? Y'all might be like, Mr. Strip, we already knew that crap. Move on, man. 
<laughs> if that's the case, let me know. So, esophagus, and so when you have uh, ascites, you'll, you'll look like a dude who's pregnant, right? I always say that. And there's pictures somewhere down here. Maybe it was up here further. I'll find it in a minute. Um, so that's part of it. And then the esophageal varices, they also, it, it's just the pressure. Um, and then it starts to leak out. So you could have either direction. Make sure you know that. Another part is decreased prothrombin production. Y'all remember PTT, right? Your PT, PTT, INR, all, all that kind of stuff. Guess what regulates that? Your liver. So you have decreased uh, prothrombin production. That places the, the client at even further risk for bleeding. That's why your patient is so at risk for bleeding. It's not just that the pressure builds up. We'd all be bleeding from places. It's that combination. It's the combination now you don't have that prothrombin production because the liver is failing. Starts making sense. Henceforth, uh, hematocyst, that's that vomiting blood. That is that, that coffee ground. It's also the melana. Make sure you know these words because the book doesn't say coffee ground poop anymore. It doesn't say, it just says melana. It says hematoresis. That is your job now to understand that. So when you're reading the test questions, it very well could be in the, uh, the question itself. And then you have to go down and determine what your plan of care is. They won't tell you the patient has cirrhosis or they might. Who knows? But they're going to give you signs and symptoms as well. All right, so if we just keep moving through that and keeping this in the same vein, think about the other part. If the portal vein is backing up, right, and the portal vein is now backing up into the spleen, there you go, splenomegaly. What happens in the spleen? This, so it says the enlarged spleen destroys platelets. It causes thrombocytopenia. It causes a lower serum, a platelet count. What are all these at risk for? Bleeding. It, it, it all goes hand in hand. That's why you learn about the heart and the liver and the kidneys and the spleen together, y'all, because they all are just one big old closed loop of blood. And that's what perfusion is. One without the other is, is pretty bad. You've seen kidney failure. You've seen liver disease. You've seen heart attacks. They all affect perfusion. All right. So thrombocytopenia is often the first clinical sign of a patient who has liver dysfunction. It starts making sense. You're like, but why? I failed to understand these concepts in nursing school, y'all. I struggled through nursing. It wasn't until I became a teacher and started teaching this stuff where I was like, oh, that's why. But like you, I was an LVN as well. So I had an LVN mindset for so many years that I just couldn't get out of. I didn't care about the why. I was just like, I know what I'm doing. So I just, I just want, to, want you to encourage that. So keep going. Once again, now we know the splenomegaly. We start knowing about the, the platelet counts. We start thinking about throttle somapenia. And then we start thinking about the, the signs of bleeding. So make sure you understand that. If we keep going down, what else does the liver do? The liver gets rid of what? Bilirubin. What is bilirubin? Do y'all know what bilirubin is? Like what is bilirubin itself? Is a breakdown of, uh, is a, the breakdown of red blood cells, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly what it is. Absolutely. Yep, good job. And what get what gets rid of broken down red blood cells? The liver. Absolutely. So when your liver fails, and you always have blood cells, right? Otherwise, you'd be dead. You know, 90 to 120 days is how long your RBCs last. That's why we do the hemoglobin A1C, correct? Because we know it's a that's a cycle of a blood cell. So if you start thinking about this, when your liver fails, and now the bilirubin starts to build up. It also prevents the absorption of the, like I said earlier, those fat soluble vitamins, specifically vitamin K. And we know that vitamin K and the clotting factors and how they go together. Patients bleed. Patients can't clot like they should. That is why everything ties together. Why do you think, what else does bilirubin cause? Bilirubin causes your poop to be brown. So when you start pooping, because you have bilirubin building up, now you have this gray, I mean, this clay colored stool. Your book talks about it. So I put it over here, the liver metabolizes old blood cells. That's what bilirubin is. It can't get rid of the bilirubin due to the blockages because it just backs up. That bilirubin causes poop to be brown. So I've always wondered, why do we have clay colored stool? I don't care anymore. Now I know why, because that's what bilirubin does. This is what nursing is trying to teach you to do. So when you're sitting there with your patient, you don't have to call anybody and ask. You just know. These are all just diseases of a liver that is backed up or too much pressure in the liver that's backing all the blood up. It starts causing everything to back up so the liver can't do its job. So all you need to know is what the liver does. The liver can't do its job anymore. Everything is going to be just the opposite. All right. So the next thing they talk about is this hepatic encephalopathy. What is that? I don't know. Something to do with the kidneys and encephalopathy. What does that mean to you? Something to do with your brain, right? 
That's what I remember. I don't have to know all the details. They have all kinds of smart people that can figure that out. But I know, once again, that the liver is not filtering stuff and it's pushing back into the spleen. And now the spleen can't filter stuff. It's all going to go back somewhere. And this is the problem with um, cirrhosis. As you do start having third space in everywhere, it even crosses the blood brain barrier. And that's why you start getting an infection or that's why you start, I don't want to say infection. That's why you start getting that buildup of pressure in your, in your brain. So anything can cause any pressure inside your skull, right? Is going to put pressure on your brain. It can affect any kind of cognitive ability, any uh, neuromuscular, uh, muscular problems, you name it, it could be there. So cognition goes down, the ability to move goes down, the consciousness, everything is kind of off. Um, specifically in your book, it listed, there's four different stages. As you know, the first stage is always the most obvious, right? What's the first sign that somebody is hypoxic? They start having cognitive changes. It's always the same with people. Our brain is pretty much the most sensitive organ in our body. As soon as it starts to build up toxins, as soon as it gets deprived of oxygen, we start seeing changes. That's why agitation, belligerence, those kind of things matter especially on your test, because you know you're talking about the liver. Just start thinking about what the test question is asking and don't get confused. As it progresses, it gets worse. You start getting hand flapping. I've seen that, that, I've seen that word used on an exam. Maybe not here, but like on ATI or NCLEX. Asterexis. Y'all heard that word? I've never heard that word. I mean, I have maybe, but I don't remember it. I was like, what is that word? Hand flapping. I was like, oh yeah, I remember that kind of. What happens in late stage? The same thing happens at every late stage. Nothing happens. So there's no more hand flapping. What happens in a patient who has respiratory failure at first? They have tachycardia. They have tachypnea. They're trying. What happens towards the, the end? They no longer compensate and they die. It shouldn't be a big secret that everything starts out slow and works its way up to death. So late stages of, of anything are pretty much closer to death. Unresponsive, unarousable, no movement. You get what I'm saying, right? Muscle rigidity. You look dead. So don't ever think, you know, you have time here. You don't have time here. I don't think they're going to ask you. They might ask specific stages. I don't remember, to be honest with you, but it's important for you to understand that concepts. So you don't have to memorize everything. All right. Lastly, on this, uh, not lastly, because we're, we're not quite there yet, but on, on this portion here with the um, hepatic encephalopathy, I need you to understand cer certain things about it again. So with encephalopathy, I already told you, you start having that, that pressure buildup in the kidney. So what's it do? It shunts that portal, right? portal hypertension. So we say portal venous blood. We're only talking about it supplies blood flow to the liver to be clean. When it doesn't go there, it bypasses. It just goes right around the liver. Your fluids will figure out a way to bypass any blockage, right? And when it does that, certain substances um, are, that are absorbed by the intestines that are supposed to be filtered, once again, back through the liver, never get filtered. So it starts causing issues. We start seeing these serum uh, ammonia levels start to go up and that is bad. So substances absorb. I told you that, make sure you understand that. You might see elevated serum levels. It starts, I mean, uh, ammonia levels. That's a byproduct of a broken down protein. We're gonna start looking at protein as well. Why? Because now your body can't do this breaking down proteins. Elevated serum ammonia levels result in the inability to deliver to detoxify protein. So a patient who is in liver failure we know that that portal hypertension is causing issues. We know we're bypassing um, the liver, so we're not getting rid of those impurities. Therefore, we can't get rid of the proteins once again. So what happens with protein in the body? It starts to build. High protein causes more ammonia. We know that ammonia is secreted through your poop. And if we can't go through the liver, we can't do it. It's all right. So there's all kinds of stuff. Constipation holds onto ammonia. Lactulose is given to poop out the ammonia. Have you ever wondered why as a nurse you gave lactulose to a patient with kidney failure? I mean, that kidney failure, liver failure. Boy, I'm off on the wrong chapter. I've given lactulose so many times. I'm like, oh, they're constipated. Well, they are kind of constipated, but that's not why we're giving it to them. We're trying to poop out the ammonia levels. I swear to God. I used to get that all the time and I knew it was for constipation. I didn't make the connection though that I couldn't put that the patient couldn't poop out the ammonia levels. That's why we put them on a high, you know, we think about the types of diet factors that contribute to worsening hepatic encephalopathy. We have to give them low protein diets. We have to pay attention to white blood cell counts and infective sources in sick patients. We have to think about hypovolemia and hypokalemia. These type of things are what has to be in your mind. So I'm not going to hit all of them, but I want you to think about diet because if we go back to the very top up here. It even says nutrition, pain, inflammation, nutrition matters. 
they're going to be proteins floating around. So sometimes we think about you go where you, you get where I'm going with this. So make sure you just understand those type of concepts. It helps tie everything back in together. Understand why you give the lactulose now is so you can get rid of that ammonia that is a byproduct of that protein that we can't get rid of. So I have a cool. question. Actually, go ahead. So these patients, their diet would be low protein, right? Because they can't excrete all that protein. So yep. they want a low protein, low, low sodium, uh, well, high carbs, right? Yeah, because it's saying, it's saying that high protein will cause you to have worsening encephalopathy. It's just for the encephalopathy. It's saying if you're hypovolemic, you're also going to have encephalopathy because you have decreased fluid volume, but you start thinking about pressure and you start thinking about sodium and you start thinking about dilute, all kinds of things start to pop up. So yeah, you're, you're 100% right. Diet is always important for every test you ever take because you never know what they're going to pop out there on you. I just like that if there's a diet related to it, I always think you should probably look at it at least. And I'm sure your teachers told you stuff in class as they're, as they're going through lectures. Listen to what they're saying. Put together what they say with what I'm saying. It starts to paint a picture. You're like, okay, I got this. Um, I've heard this term also on an exam. I don't know which exam. I, I, when I say exam, I don't say for your exam. I've been an educator for a long time. So like the hepatorenal syndrome. Why do I even bring that up? Because what else are we talking about this week or over this three weeks on this test? The, the liver and the kidney, the hepatorenal syndrome. Y'all, they're connected. Everything is connected. It, occur, it occurs after clinical deterioration from GI bleeding. I'm not going to get into it. I just want you to understand that everything is connected here. That's why perfusion goes together. That's why these three units are on the same exam. We're doing concepts. We're doing exemplars. We're not just doing body systems anymore. We're trying to make you better nurses. How physicians have done it for years, right? We don't want you memorizing stuff. We want you to understand how the body works. So when you're taking care of our children, you're like, ah, that's what it is. And you don't kill my child. I, I mean that with all due respect and sincerity because I don't want, you, I want my child to die because somebody made a mistake. Nor do you want me to kill your kid because I'm not paying attention to my job. All right, so that's it. That's kind of, that, that's cirrhosis in a nutshell. When I, when I think about some of the problems, what could go on? What are some other causes of cirrhosis? Hepatitis B and D. We know those are the most common causes. Where do people get hepatitis uh, B and D? It kind of depends on where you, what you're doing. I mean, it could be from, we know that hepatitis B is, is sometimes from sexual intercourse. It could be from IV drug use, things like, it just depends. The, the literature changes all the time, but you know what kind of patient, it puts you at risk for certain things. So make sure if you have a patient with hepatitis that you automatically start thinking about liver disease. If you have an alcoholic, we know that alcohol is one of the most contributing factors, right? To that, that cirrhosis. But they also have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Y'all have heard of fatty liver disease. That's just like a precursor. Um, it, it's, it, it's just changes in your liver. If it's full of fat versus healthy tissue, are you really filtering like you should? The answer is no. That's all we're talking about. It's not near as bad, but it, it's, it's still though. It's still something you want to think about. I don't hit a lot on it, but if you were to see those on the exam, it should get your mind thinking about cirrhosis and start thinking about liver function start thinking about what the idea of the liver is and what it does and how it's going to present when, the, when there's a problem. So, all right. Um, I've already, I, I, well, I'm like a, a broken record here. I talk about the exposure to alcohol and drugs, right? Um, chemical toxins, sexual history, all of those things matter. Will they pop up on your exam? I don't know. But you know how NCLEX and ATI and we are. We can put out any kind of little material that gives you an idea. You're like, oh, hold up now. They said this, this, and this. Those three things go together. It paints a picture. When you're picking up that, that, that uh, assessment data, we put so much assessment data on exams that you never even know about because you don't get enough time to get in the book and read. I want you to know the kind of stuff we're, we're asking, what's going to be in the questions. All right. So your physical assessment, once again, fatigue. Um, significant changes in your weight. If you're retaining fluid, that makes sense. Have you ever seen somebody with cirrhosis, a patient with cirrhosis? What happens to their body? A dimethus, right? I had a guy named, uh, well, he's dead. He's been dead for 30 years. Mr. Smartwood, he was the first patient I ever took care of. And uh, he was in the Marine Corps. He retired Marine Corps uh, Master Sergeant, which is high up there. He spent 30 years in the Marine Corps. He drank a handle of uh, Jack Daniels every day. It's not a fifth. It's like a, I don't know how big a handle is, but that's what he did. And he has cirrhosis. I remember being a 19-year-old kid in the ICU at Camp Pendleton, California on the Marine Corps base in a naval hospital and seeing this great big dude 
he was so swollen. I've never seen he like a balloon. And if you touched him, fluid just seeped out everywhere. He had to be on, oh my God, I'll never forget cirrhosis because of that dude. You know what I mean? Like it was just ingrained in my mind. That's why you're, that's why you get fatigued. Fluid volume overload, significant changes in weight. These things start to make sense. Pain. These are things you can do stuff about, right? I just want you to understand what it is. Think about jaundice and, and, and what that looks like. Think about their dry skin and pruritus. That, that is a safety issue for your, for your, um, what do, you, what do you call it? For, for your patient, if they start scratching and get infections, um, they might have petechiae and ecchymosis. We've seen that on a lot of other stuff as well. Uh, ascites, vitamin C deficiencies, ADEC, we know vitamin K, bleeding disorder. So I'm trying to hit the things that I know will lead to better understandings and will help you answer so many more questions on the exam. Don't forget, I've been an educator for a lot of years. I know how we ask questions. I've written questions. I know this is the kind of stuff that's going to gear your mind into that. All right. Uh, last part here is that uh, the uh, hepatomegaly. Hepatomegaly. Boy, I can't speak. Liver enlarging. That's all we're talking about. Splenomegaly. Uh, the spleen is enlarged. Make sure you understand the differences. You know, liver occurs early signs of cirrhosis. We know that splenomegaly, a lot of times non-alcoholic causes cirrhosis. So I'm not saying there's ever going to be anything on there, but what do we know about both of these? We need to do abdominal girth. We need to see how much you're growing. I know on tests, you always see what is the best way to measure fluid volume, mode, blah, 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 all that. Is it daily weights? Is it eyes and nose? Is it abdominal girth? I'm sure it's always going to be daily weights because a pound, a liter of fluid weighs the same amount regardless what it is. We're saying specifically with these type of patients, abdominal girth is important because of the ascites, because of the, uh, you get where I'm going here. That's all we're talking about. So know when it's important, know when it's not important. Make sure you understand labs. If you don't know labs at this point in the game, you got to go back and learn. You have to understand what the liver does. Think about the AST, the, a, the ALT. Those are liver type of things. When the, when, when the ratios are above one, it's usually found in alcoholic liver disease. I don't know that it'd ever be a question or not, but it sounds like something that ATI might care about or NCLEX or anybody else. Maybe not. But every time you see a lab value on an exam and you don't know what the lab value is, you instinctively just choose it because you think it's got to be the right answer. Have y'all ever done that before? Lord knows I do it all the time. I'm like, I don't know what that lab value is. It's probably right. And I just choose it. Unless I know definitively the other one's right or wrong, but it, it can be very problematic. Um, know what those mean. Know, know what that talks about. Know that um, albumin levels. What are albumin? We're talking about what? Protein. We know that the best way to measure somebody's protein level is to look at their, their pre-albumin levels. So that should start making sense to you. We understand why the albumin levels, total serum albumin levels may be decreased in patients with a fear chronic, decreased synthesis of the liver. It starts making sense. Think about the proteins and, and uh, the albumin. I just want you to go back and look at that. The PT, the PTT, the INRs. I put all kinds, and I don't think you need to go back and get this in depth with it, but to me, it was interesting. I started thinking about how it really impacts your hemoglobin and your hematocrit, how you could have anemia because of the decreased red blood cell, right? They're, they're not breaking them down like they should. So anemia is another thing. We're not having good formation. That, another reason why the patient could be short of breath and fatigued all the time. They're, they're anemic. Interesting. You, you can't learn everything in the book. I promise you that. You and I both know this to be the truth. You just can't. Some of the earliest things we're going to do is an ultrasound. They're going to look and see what it looks like. That's it. Stiffness. I don't even know what a kilo, I don't even know what that word means, to be honest with you. I mean, I do, but I don't. I, I never went back and looked at it. I just know certain numbers. I don't even know what that number means, to be honest with you. I don't work with these kind of patients on a daily basis. You probably won't either. Your test probably won't. But ultrasound is something we do. I just keep these things in mind. All right. Here's what I want you to think about as you go home today is what is the nurse's role in fluid volume overload? That's all we've been talking about all week about everything, cardiac, the kidneys. It's all about third spacing. It's all about fluid, the pressure getting too high somewhere, and it's causing that fluid that's intervascular to seep out of the vascular system and go into the interstitial tissues. In this, if that happens in the pulmonary circulation, it's called a pulmonary edema because it starts to go into the alveoli. If it happens in your leg, we call it peripheral edema. As the pressure builds in your lower calves and the fluid starts to build and build, it seeps out and you get those big swollen legs. Here, it goes into your stomach. That's all ascites is. Once again, it's fluid shifts. 
um, potential for hemorrhage due to the portal hypertension, due to the GI varices, due to the lack of uh, clotting factors, due to all the things we talked about. This is where your money's going to be at. All of your all of your interventions focus on fluid volume correction. Um, What's here? Acute confusion. I, once again, a little, I'm thinking about things I can do. What can I do? Pariditis due to increased serum bilirubin. room. Mm, that is a problem with skin. I don't make this stuff up. Your book says it because it's that important. Somebody has taken care of these patients for so many years. They know what the main problems are. Guess who else cares what the main problems are? Everybody who has the main problems, including patients, NCLEX, and us. So know that. Know about nutrition. We've talked about it already. Know about drug therapy. Think about what you need to do, fluid and electrolyte imbalances. Um, there's just, there's a lot to go over and I know it. Backup of unfiltered blood through the liver can cause infections in the stomach due to ascites. I've talked about that already. I keep taking notes. This is what I expect you to do if you want to be successful. Think about bacterial peritonitis. We've already talked about, we've talked about peritonitis already in another, in another type of patient, the one who is on peritoneal dialysis, right? Peritonitis is peritonitis, regardless of what causes it. It looks the same. It feels the same. It says the same. It starts making, making sense, though. This, this is a source where it comes in from the portal vein, not you know filtering blood. The other one is when we put a fluid into your, into your peritoneal area to try to filter blood. Kind of same, same. If you have too much fluid buildup in your stomach, they'll go in there and do a paracentesis. And a paracentesis is where they go in with a big old needle and they aspirate fluid. That's it. Do you do anything with, with um, paracentesis? Absolutely not. You don't do that, but it's going to be at the bedside it's going to, or at, at interventional radiology. So there might be things you need to think about. And I know there is because it says nursing implications associated with this procedure, best practices, blah, blah, blah. And where is it? Right below here. So make sure you're thinking about vital signs, including weight before the procedure. So when they come back, you can see how much fluid was taken off. I already told you weight is the best indicator of fluid retention because fluid, a liter of fluid weighs exactly the same as a liter of fluid, regardless where it comes from. That's why it makes better sense. Ask the patient to void before the procedure because of the bladder and not injuring it. Just head the bed elevated. These are certain things that, you know, they pop up, y'all. I don't know where they're going to pop up somewhere, but they do. So that's what I'm trying to get you to start focusing on. You can go through and keep, keep going back. Make sure you understand the BUN. Fluid volume overload causes hypoxia because now your, your lungs are also going to be inundated with fluid, right? Hypoxemia causes the kidneys to release more what? Urethropetin. I can't say that word, which increases your hematocrit. The liver makes proteins, so you would need to decrease the proteins, right? That's why you've got to give them a low protein diet because of all of these things being connected together. It's so cool, but it's a lot to, you don't have to memorize everything. Get the main concept, understand where it's breaking up, understand why it's backing up. You don't have to memorize. So what do you need to do? What are your interventions? You're going to do a lot of observation, screen, make sure you're looking for varices, make sure you're looking for ascites, make sure you're looking for signs and symptoms of bleeding or fluid volume overload or infection. All the things the top of the book told you to look for right? If bleeding occurs, what are your intervention? It all depends. We're probably going to get a vasorestrictive drug to try to stop the bleeding from those, um, those, uh, little my, those little vasculature um, capillaries. My God, I can't think today. We're going to try to get those to occlude on themselves. That's what we're doing. We're going to give a beta blocker because we know that beta blocker helps prevent bleeding as well. And if you don't know that, you have to go back and read. I can't re-explain that to you. That's um. a problem. But, yeah, I was just going to ask. I was reading that. I thought the beta block was for blood pressure, reducing blood pressure, and it decreases the demand of the heart, right? And it also, it also affects your oxygen. So when you give a beta blocker, you have to think about how somebody breathes. You have to think about their heart rate. Because if you think about beta cells in the body, there are multiple beta cells. So like I said, that's a whole nother discussion. You'd have to go back in the body and see where those beta cells are. And then you start seeing how these beta blocking agents can cause some issues with blood pressure, can cause people in their breathing to be significant, can help with bleeding as well. Yeah, okay. yeah, it's a great question, but man, you can't go back and relearn patho and all that. And that's what I mean, y'all. Studying for an exam is not the exact same thing as studying for nursing school. You can study for exam and data dump and still pass nursing school. And I tell you to do that in combination with learning. You need to do both. Path is hard as hell, excuse my language, but y'all know what it is. It is tough to learn all this information. It is really challenging to walk out after two years and say, I'm a great RN. You won't be, but you'll at least be safe. You'll know where to turn. You'll know where to look for it. And you'll know what you don't know, which is just as important as knowing what you do know.
So go back and look at some of the things. Look at the basic. Like I said, this is just for you. I can't go over everything because it would be, it would be I just can't. Go back and look at things that matter for a nurse. If I keep looking, if I start thinking about vitamin and minerals and I start thinking about fat soluble and iron supplements and all of the things that start playing into it. Um, think about diuretics. If we have fluid volume overload, here's a big one right here, which I liked and I, and I, I didn't do this on purpose yet. Patients often diagnosed uh, are discharged with diuretics, which is great because they have fluid volume overload. I know the one thing about hypertension is the same thing regardless. If I have portal hypertension, of hypertension, all this backup leads a backup somewhere else and it backs up into the kidneys and I don't care. I'm pretty certain my kidneys are going to have some problems as well. So it makes me scared. And I think about that. Teach about the side effects of certain kinds of therapies like potassium wasting or potassium sparing. It depends on what's going on there. So um, that takes us down to 266. It gets into hepatitis. Y'all covered hepatitis in um, 242 and 170. So I, it's not on this exam that I know of other than the fact that it causes hep cirrhosis. So I have to stop at this point. I promise I will go ahead and do the other portion and just post it tonight as well. So if you want to go back and watch it, it'll be there for you. And I do apologize that I got my times confused. I hope this was helpful. I'm going to stop. Where can we find that? I'm, yesterday, we're going to show.